Hey everybody, this is Nicole Pascal with Topaz Labs. We are excited to have Hal Schmidt from the Light Photographic Workshops here with us today. Hello, Hal. Hello. <laughs> um, we are here today for output sharpening for print with Topaz Detail, and that's going to be presented by Hal. Um, Hal is the director and lead instructor of light photographic workshops out of Los Osos, California. He instructs all levels of photography there as well as Lightroom, Photoshop, and his workshops and photo tours are quickly becoming known and recognized around the world as really incredible learning experiences. And as director of the LEP Institute, Hal was fortunate to train with photography and Photoshop's best and brightest. And he is uh, quickly becoming an expert in all aspects of the digital workflow. Today we're excited to have him demonstrate his personal output sharpening workflow and how Topaz Detail is incorporated in that. A couple quick technical things here first. Uh, if you have any questions along the way, you can type them into your questions uh, module on your GoToWebinar panel. And Ashley Robinson, our product manager, and myself, Nicole, will be answering those. And then Hal will be answering a few questions as well after his presentation. If you have any trouble with sound, you can go ahead and call in, and the number is going to be on your GoToWebinar invitation for this particular webinar. So with that, I will give it over to Hal. Okay, thanks everybody for, uh, for coming today. I, I guess coming is the right word, uh, or, or attending uh, over the internet. We're going to talk today just for a little bit about one of my favorite subjects, and that is the output process. It's for me where the, the rubber really meets the road in the entire digital workflow. It's, it's a time when we can take everything that we've done from, from setting up an image, from travel, from capture, all the time we might have spent in, in Photoshop, Lightroom, the uh, different Topaz Labs plugins, and, and end up with something tangible, having a print uh, to either use for our own enjoyment or give it to clients, family, friends, whatever it might be. Now that, that process can be one of the most frustrating and confusing parts of the entire workflow uh, for a lot of reasons. And, and one of those things that people tend to get a little bit wrapped up about is, is this concept of output sharpening. and Why do we have to do it? How much should I do it? Is there a, a magic setting that works for me? There are so many different options in terms of different programs, different features within the same program. What, what do I choose to, to make this all happen? So I'm going to give you a, a quick take on how I do the output sharpening, as well as some overall, I guess, motherhood, if you will, on different types of sharpening and a gen generic output workflow. Because although sharpening is fairly important and it is the, the key of our point of our discussion today, it's just one little cog in the wheel of finally getting a print out. Sharpening itself is uh, one of the most contentious things out there. And the way, if you sit back and listening, listen to conversations about sharpening, you, you'll see and hear a lot of different opinions, and, and folks get very worked up about it. Now, for me, sharpening is kind of cool because, one, I try not to get too worked up about it, but also, it's, it's nothing new. And so, what you might not expect to see here in a webinar on Topaz detail is a cave painting. And I start almost every discussion on output sharpening with a cave painting to to describe that, that this is not a new process. What we're going to use Topaz Detail to do in a, in a very spectacular manner and to help us out is nothing different than what the folks did way back when in these caves in France when they were painting the horses that were out there on the plains. Now, if you notice on this horse, there should be a couple things that, that maybe click into your head immediately. Why would I put this up in a sharpening discussion? Now, any time I, I want, kind of want to direct your eyes to some place in particular, I'm going to move my cursor to an area of the screen. And if it's a little bit challenging to see, I'll, I'll try and hit my uh, control key, which gives you some circles. And depending upon your internet connection speed, you may or, or may not see these. But I'll leave that cursor in a specific spot and try not to move it around too quickly. So I have this cursor sitting there out in there in the belly of the horse. And directly underneath, what you might see is a fine black line. What this cave artist was doing, doing thousands or hundreds of years ago, I'm not exactly sure, was they were sharpening. They were using a form of output sharpening. Now, the bottom color of that horse, it probably is relatively tan and a very light brown. Well, it turns out the media on which this artist was working, the cave wall, was about the same. So the problem that the artist had was, where does the subject end and the media begin? 
there's going to be a little bit of a loss there. So their solution was to take a fine black line and in effect sharpen. Now did this cave painter sharpen their image? Not at all. But instead what they did was they used an optical illusion. Me, who I'm, I'm looking at this image, I see the sharp outline of a horse even though the resolution they had with the rock at the cave wall as well as whatever type of paint they were using, resolution wasn't that good, but I see these fine outlines. So this process of sharpening is going to be the exact same thing that was used by early artists all the way up through the, the classical masters and, and artists today, whether they use the digital media or any time, uh, type of, uh, of older, whether it be, I don't know, watercolor, oil, pastel, whatever it is, sharpening is shared by all of these different things. So sharpening itself, we're going to broadly classify sharpening into three different types. And our focus today is output sharpening. But just to put it into context, there is other sharpening that you're going to need to be aware of if you want to end up with that final product. Now, the first type of, input, of sharpening we have is called input sharpening. And input sharpening, as you might expect, occurs at the beginning of your digital workflow. And that is designed to overcome some of the limitations that we have in our sensor design primarily that, that low pass or the anti-aliasing filter that we find on some SLRs that intentionally blurs our incoming light signal just a little bit. Now this is to regain some of that sharpness. Typically input sharpening is going to be done in your image optimization software of choice. Uh, for me, you're looking at the Lightroom interface here. I'll also do it inside of Adobe Camera Raw as a part of Photoshop. Discussing in Topaz Detail, I will show you there are times that I use Topaz Detail to go in and do my input sharpening, and I'll show you exactly where it is that I recognize the sharpening methods that we find in some of our Adobe products don't answer the mail, and I need to go someplace else. But just remember that input happens at the beginning of the process. The next type we have is content or creative sharpening. This is something that we're typically going to do in the middle of our workflow as we optimize an image. Content and creative sharpening is used by, by all of us as, as photographic artists to do a couple of things, but the, the primary thing is to try and somehow make our subject a little bit more interesting, whether it's adding shape and form or we just make the subject a little bit sharper relative to the background, knowing that our viewer's eye is going to tend towards or gravitate to whatever's sharpest inside the image. The final type of sharpening we have is output sharpening, and that's going to be our main feature today. We output sharpen, as you might expect from the word, at the end of the process. Output sharpening we're going to do for, for two main reasons. And, and the first of those is that when we go from a monitor, which has a very large dynamic range, and don't want to get too deep into to tonal discussion here, but the dynamic range is the difference between the darkest part of the image and the brightest part of the image. The wider that is, the wider the dynamic range, or the bigger the dynamic range. So our monitor can get very bright, as well as have nice dark black. A lot of our photographic media doesn't have an equivalent dynamic range. So if I go to an output media that can't get quite as bright and can't get as dark, that decreased dynamic range is going to appear as if the image is softer. And that's going to seem like we didn't get our job done properly in the camera. The second reason that we're going to use output sharpening is to overcome a little problem called dot gain. And dot gain, that we, we have that with inkjet printers, as the small ink droplets hit different media, they're going to spread out just a little bit. And that, that spreading of the ink onto the media is going to give us the appearance of a softer image. So when we couple these two things together, dot gain and a decreased dynamic range, if we do everything right, but don't take those into account, our print is going to look softer than the image should be. So these are our overall three types of sharpening. Input, content, and output. Now, when we look at these specific types of sharpening, input and content sharpening, those are going to apply to what's called a master file. And a master file is size independent. Okay? That is, whether it's living in Lightroom, in Photoshop, however you do it, this is that file that's going to contain all of your adjustments, all of the tone, all of the color, all of the everything. Input and content belong in your master file. Now when we transition over to output sharpening, that is very dependent on a couple of things. First and foremost is the size of the image, and finally, the, or secondly, the media type that you're going to print to. So output sharpening is something that does not belong in a master file. Instead, you would typically create from your master file an output file, and onto that, 
we would apply the specific levels of sharpening that correspond to the image size in terms of the final print and the media type that we're using. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we might modify our output sharpening settings based on different sizing and media types here in just a little bit. Sharpening itself fits into the overall output workflow. And just so you've seen it here and where it fits in, the overall workflow for output is going to look like this. I have a master file that is finished. It contains not only my input, but also my creative or content sharpening. It has all of my tonal adjustments, all of my color uh, adjustments. It has everything. When I decide that it's time to go to print, I need to take a couple steps to get it right. The first thing I'm going to do is select a specific aspect ratio. How many units high by how many units wide, and this is typically going to correspond to whatever media size that I'm using. The second step, once I've determined aspect ratio, is I need to resize the image. I need to take the image that had been size independent, and now I'm going to consider what are the physical dimensions going to be when I put this print or put this image to paper. This is that place that we would get in and talk about how many inches high by how many inches wide and what kind of resolution, how many pixels per inch might be required. After we have appropriately sized the image, then it's time to sharpen. We go in and sharpen for that size as well as the media type, moving on to the fourth workflow step, which is a proof. The soft proofing that we typically do prior to print, and for those that aren't familiar with light out here in California, we are, we are a big print house and teach a lot of printing. We are fortunately resourced to print a lot, and we do a lot of testing. One of the things we believe strongly in is that soft proof concept where I go in and I take a look at the image and how it's going to render, or as close as possible, how it's going to render on my selected media type. One of the biggest things that I'm going to do during this step is choose a rendering intent, typically either a relative color metric or perceptual. One of those two is going to be the clear victor. I'll choose the correct one and move on into the print phase of my output workflow. Okay. So if I follow these steps on an output file, things are going to go pretty well. Right. So, so that's enough of the, the PowerPoint-esque kind of slides. And instead, I want to look just a little bit now at the, the actual process of sharpening itself, which is why you all are here. And, and for that, I'm going to use this image of an eagle that I shot up in Alaska. And I'm going to consider this here a master file. My master file has appropriate aspect ratio. It is, probably it does not have an aspect ratio assigned just yet that might match up, but it, it's size independent. It's got the tone, it's got the color, it's got everything done to it, but what it doesn't have is it hasn't been introduced to that output workflow. So we're just going to pretend today and say that, all right, the aspect ratio that, that came out of the camera, what I have right here, that's good to go. Sizing, I've taken care of that as well. And we're going to put it right into the next option, which is to sharpen. So with that, I, I want to slide over to Photoshop. And you might be wondering, you know, you're inside a Lightroom how it, it does some great work. If I use Topaz Fusion, I could just launch right into detail from there and I could sharpen that way. And, and the Lightroom print interface is actually pretty good and pretty slick. Wouldn't that be a better workflow option? Um, for us here at Light, we, we recommend to, to not print from Lightroom and instead do it from, from Photoshop. Uh, the reason for that is I, I do have full control over everything I do in detail, as you'll see here later, as well as having that soft proofing option that we talked about earlier. So as, as capable as, as Lightroom is, especially when combined with, with Fusion to do some, some detail work, we still typically go in to Photoshop proper when we're considering that, that final fine art print. So inside of, of Photoshop here, I want to examine this image at first and see what is output sharpening all about? What am I looking to accomplish? Well, when I, when I look at the eagle and on this, this kind of pastel uh, cloud and sky background, what do I need to be concerned about when I want to output sharpen? Well, I'd like it to still be sharp. Now, I know based on my dynamic range decrease to a media, as well as dot gain, that everything's going to get a little bit soft. But I can't have that. I, I need this eagle's eye to be as sharp in the print as it is here inside of my basic image. So the output sharpening process is going to allow me to slightly make it a little too sharp for what I see here on screen, but it's going to translate very, very well once I get over to my output media. When we output sharpen, in general, we want to try and output sharpen only fine edges and texture detail. 
When you look at output sharpening, that's what it's all about. Very, very small details, the fine edges, the little bits of texture here and there that are going to be very noticeable if they're soft in that final print. There are a lot of places, though, in the image that aren't that critical for sharpening. If you take a look around this eagle here, there are going to be some parts of the bird, based on my, my depth of field, that are out of focus. Maybe, say, the, the back end here of some of the tail feathers or maybe one of the, the talons. I'll also notice that the clouds in the background are slightly out of focus based on the depth of field that I had. So there are some places where maybe I, I don't necessarily want to sharpen. And, and I'll talk about our five rules for where you don't want to sharpen in just a little bit. So going into this process, I know that I need to enhance the fine details in this image to overcome some of those limitations when I print. In order to do this, I'm going to take my background layer and I'm going to copy it. Now I'm going to do that to make this entire process non-destructive, as well as to give me the option for using a mask or some additional blend modes if I need to and want to take this sharpening to the next level. So we always believe in that, that non-destructive type of workflow, which means copy the background. Now you can do that a bunch of different ways. Uh, you know that Adobe gives you plenty of different options. So the one that I like to do is I just grab my background and drag it down to the Create New Layer icon, and that gives me a background copy. If you're more a keyboard shortcut kind of person, remember it's the Control J on Windows, Command J on the Mac is going to jump that background layer and give you a copy. Now another good option or another good workflow is that I like to rename my layers as I go along. That way they make complete sense to me. And I'm just going to call this one Topaz Sharpen. I'm just taking a quick look at a question that's coming right now. The question is, as I'm con considering sharpening, is it the same for a photo from a, a lab as it would be for an inkjet printer? And it just depends on, on what lab you're using and what uh, printers they use. And that's something you can ask them about if they're using different types of inkjet printers, if they're using some kind of offset. There, there's a lot of different options out there as to what they would be using. And you can ask them what is going to be the specific dot gain associated with their printer and their media. And, and they're not going to give you a certain uh, specific number for it but they'll give you an indication of how much you may or may not need to sharpen. Now, some labs out there will do a little bit of the sharpening for you. I'm not a big fan of that. I want to include that all myself. So if I'm preparing an image to go to, go to a lab, I'm going to include all of the sharpening in that final image, send it to the lab, and then they can just print as is without any consideration for, those, for, for that portion of the output workflow. So one, once I have a, a second layer of Topaz Sharpen, I'm going to bring up my Topaz. So I'll go down to Filter, Labs. I'm going to click on Detail. And we'll see the, the Detail panel pop up here. And I'll notice that the, the plugin is pre-processing the image. And actually a really important thing. And it might seem a little bit of a pain in the butt at first. Okay, I've, I'm in my workflow. I've got to wait for it to process. But the beauty of, of paying up front with your, with your timing is that once I have the image loaded and pre-processed, all of my adjustments happen almost instantaneously. And that's a great thing, especially compared with something like Photoshop, where I'm going to make my sharpening adjustments, and then depending upon the size of the image and the speed of my processor, I might need to wait two or three seconds before I see those results. Looking at the overall detail panel here, we're we're not actually going to use most of this when we see when we're using output sharpening. Now there are a lot of different presets available that do very very cool things. I will use these in other parts of my workflow, especially when I'm looking to make some tonal, color, or content sharpening adjustments. But for now, the presets really aren't going to aren't going to work for me. You might ask that question. Well, if I come up with a, a good sharpening setting, could I save it as a preset and use it on other images? And I'd love to tell you yes. But what you look at with output sharpening, you'll find that it's very image dependent. And not only is it image dependent, it's going to be size dependent and what media type. So you could create a preset for a specific image at a specific size on a specific media, but unfortunately that preset is only going to apply to, to that one condition. So when it comes to sharpening, output sharpening that is for me, I tend not to use a, a preset and instead every single image is going to get slightly different levels of sharpening. So when I look at the right panel on detail, I'm going to see that I've got the different tabs here. I'm looking at the detail all the way down through color tabs. 
Now the two of these that are really going to apply to sharpening are my detail tab and then also the deblur tab. Now the deblur tab, since I have it open right now, it really doesn't have anything to do with our output sharpening. But there are times if I need to go in and do some type of input sharpening external to my other software, the deblur tab here is a great way to accomplish that if I can't get it done someplace else. For output sharpening, the detail tab is where we're going to spend all of our time. Just a real quick look through this, this tab itself, we'll see that it starts up at the top with small detail and goes all the way down to large boost. And they think of it as, as three different pairs, small detail and boost, medium detail boost, and then large detail and boost. Small, medium, and large, those are important things for us to think about when we're looking to sharpen. Sharpening can be done at many different levels, but output sharpening is only going to be done at one level. What do we want to do with output sharpening? It's all about fine detail, it's little bits of texture here and there. It really has nothing to do with how the, the bird truly interacts with the clouds or how the beak meets the face of the bird. Things like that are more of a medium or large detail that are going to build in for us shape and form. So when we look at output sharpening, we're really only talking about two sliders in the entire interface of detail. Now, before you go in and start doing any type of output sharpening here, you want to make sure that you've hit reset all. That reset all is going to make sure that everything is zeroed because we don't want to be introducing any other, any other strange issues as we do our sharpening. So once I hit reset all, I know that everything is going to be zeroed out and I can, instead, I can now turn my attention to the detail tab itself and the small detail small boost. To work this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom into the image. And, and for today, I'm going to take it into the one-to-one the -one view, where we have one pixel in the image is going to equal one pixel on my display. Now, typically, for my workflow, I don't use this. I'm going to find myself somewhere between 50 and 75% magnification as I'm judging my, my output sharpening here, because I find that equates fairly well to my final print resolution. and it just turns out, I think, a little bit nicer. Over webinar, it gets really hard to see. So I'm going to leave it at 100% here and start looking at what happens as I move my, my sliders. What we're concerned about in output sharpening is where well, there are fine details and little bits of, of texture here and there. Since I'm looking at fine stuff, I'm limiting only to small detail and boost. So what's really the difference between these two? Well. Small detail, these are small details that are easily visible to the eye. So if I look into this image right here along the eye of the bird, I can see that, okay, where the, where the pupil meets the iris, that is a fine line there, really easy to see. It's not soft, it's not subtle, it's staring at me right there. There's a lot of other places like that in the image. I'll see some of the feather details like that. I'll notice you know, the, the uh, top of the beak here. I'm seeing this, this breathing hole right there, the little nostril. That is all a small detail that is easily visible. Small boost, that is going to boost details that aren't quite as visible. If we look into an image, there's a lot of contrast and, and fine details that are, aren't very apparent. These cases typically happen when there's not much tonal variation between those details. In general, small boost during this output workflow is going to stay at zero. I'll explain the reason for that in, in just a moment. The small detail slider, though, that's the one we're going, to we're going to concentrate on. If I move the slider to the left, that is going to minimize detail. Okay? That is not what we want here. If I soften up the image and print it, it's going to look even softer. So that tells me that everything is going to begin at a minimum right at zero. And the slider can be a little bit challenging sometimes to get to zero. So remember, if you just double click onto the name of the slider, it will reset it right to zero and you can have it at the starting position. So knowing that we're not going to go left, the only other option is going right with that slider. So as I move the small detail slider to the right, and I'm going to throw it all the way to the outside, and that highlights for me that, that this is a non-destructive process. This is completely a, a time to play around. I can move the slider any place I like to see what it does. 
In fact, I'm going to use a, an expression from one of my, my favorite instructors, Jack Davis. And he says, I give you full permission to move those sliders any place you like. So if you're playing around with detail, I give you complete permission to throw it out there and see what happens, even if it might be too much. So as I move that, that small detail slider, I'm moving all the way out to one. I have boosted these small details as much as I possibly can. The best way to assess what you have done inside of the program is to look at a before and after. And fortunately, detail gives us a really easy way to do that. I can just move my cursor into the image where I see the small hand show up and then click the mouse. As I click the mouse, that's going to take me from before to after. And that's what we want to key into as we're deciding what level of sharpening is appropriate for a specific image. So before and after. That is always the best way to figure out anything we've done to an image, whether it's sharpening, tone, color, you name it. It's kind of like those, if you've ever seen that, that little game where they show you two pictures and say, okay, in the second picture I've changed five things, see if you can find it. Those can be a little bit challenging to do, but if I were able to overlay those two pictures and toggle one on and off, you would see the five differences immediately. That's the exact same process that we're going to do here as we just click on and off. Now, as I leave this effect on, you'll see that the image does, in fact, appear to be sharper. Now, we know this is an optical illusion, just like the cave painting. What detail is doing behind the scenes is it's taking the luminosity values, all of the, think of it as the grayscale data in this image, and it is making some slight modifications. Any place that it finds contrast, it's going to take, say, a bright pixel that's next to a dark pixel. It's going to take the bright, make it a little brighter the dark a little darker. Now that's kind of a simplification of what it does, but as it boosts that contrast, the optical illusion to us, the user, is a sharper image. Now detail is going to do that for us everywhere, and you can see, hopefully this is translating across the net, where you can see not only is my eagle appearing a little bit sharper, but also is the sky and just about any place else within this image. The question then, the hardest part of this whole process is how much. Where should I set my slider? Now setting that slider is going to be based, of course, on the image, on the image size, as well as the media type that you're using. So I like to set a, a basic going in position. And what I call this is my, is my Goldilocks position. Now you, know, you remember Goldilocks, right? I'm sure you've heard about her at some point. Goldilocks was that girl who went in, okay, I'm going to try some porridge. Well, this one's too hot. This one's too cold. Okay, this one's just right. Well, this bed's too hard, this one's too soft, this one's just right. So what we're going to try and do is find that just right amount of sharpening by using only one slider, the small detail. Okay? And that's one of the real benefits of details and output sharpening. Not only is the algorithm giving me a very clean artifact and halo free sharpening effect, but it's also one slider. Okay? I love things when there's only one variable. Okay? As I start adding two, three variables, it gets increasingly complex. So what is the right level? What's that Goldilocks level of sharpening? Our standard condition for this is going to be a, a normal size print. We're going to call that anywhere in the 8 by 10 to 13 by 19 regime, kind of a, a normal size print coming out of most of our, our desktop inkjet printers these days. We're also going to say that this is on photo paper. So photo paper has a relatively tight dot gain, and it also has a fairly wide dynamic range. So if I look at that 8, to 8 by 10, 13 by 19 on photo paper, I'll see that there really isn't a huge amount of sharpening required to overcome the negative effects. So the basic level of sharpening that we want to find is going to apply in this, what I'd call, best case scenario. We'll see that as I transition to different media types or different sizes, then I'm going to actually have to start kicking up the levels of sharpening, and I'll give you some basic recommendations for that in just a moment. So with my small detail slider, what I want to do is as I toggle on and off, I want to just be able to notice the difference. If I see the difference like it is now where sharpening is off, all of a sudden sharpening is on, and it's really apparent, okay, that's going to be too much. That's our porridge is too hot. So I would go in, and I typically start this small detail slider at about 0.5. And then I will toggle on and off to see if I like what has happened with the sharpening. So how, how do you know? This is kind of a generic concept. You may be thinking, okay, Hal, you're coming up with a, a Goldilocks level of sharpening. What does that mean to me? How do I know where I am in the image? 
Well, if you don't have enough sharpening, here's what's going to happen. When you toggle on and off, so original to preview, when you do that, if you feel this happening, it's not enough. The first thing you might feel yourself doing is moving closer to your display. So if you feel yourself moving closer to the display, trying to see, is something happening? Probably not enough. The second thing you're going to notice yourself doing as you're moving closer to the display is if you squint your eyes or if you readjust your glasses and click that on and off. If you get closer, squint, or readjust your glasses to see, is there a difference? That is not enough. Okay? That's our porridge is too cold. Now let's define the opposite condition. As I'm going back and forth in detail, what if it's too much sharpening? How do I know that it's too much? Well, the first thing that's going to happen is this. As I toggle from the original to preview, I'm going to see that sharpening or this effect just kind of pop me in the face. If it pops you in the face and you kind of want to move backwards just a little bit, that's too much. The second thing that you're going to notice is that the image starts to look more graphic or more illustrated than photographic. Now, certainly we can use that as, as some type of, of creative element to our image, but if you're doing it for that, that's more in our content or creative sharpening. This is strictly to deal with some printer issues. So we don't want to see our image go from photographic to illustrative when we go from original to preview. And those are the two biggest clues that we have. One, I feel like I need to back off a little bit. The second is that everything looks illustrative. So our goal as the photographer then is to find that just right level where I'm not squinting and I'm not illustrative. So I typically set right there around 0.5, and I will toggle on and off and see, okay, is it just noticeable? For me, on this image, 0.5 is a little bit too much. So I'm going to take this small detail, and I'm going to move it over to about 0.4. So I just drop it down about 0.1, and then I toggle on and off again. As I toggle on and off again, I'm seeing that it is just noticeable. For me, that's going to be about that just right position. The process of setting your output sharpening level using the small detail slider, one variable, is just that. Start someplace in the middle, right about 0.5, and then turn it on and off. If it's just noticeable, don't do anything else, we can hit OK. If you're feeling yourself squint, go up a little bit, go to about 0.6. If you feel yourself uh, saying, wow, that's a little bit illustrative, Take it down, go to point 0.4, go to point 0.3. There's no right answer here other than what you think is that right amount. When is it just visible to you as you toggle on and off? Sharpening is one of those things that if you have to make any error, you want to under sharpen as opposed to over sharpen. So if there's any doubt, there really is no doubt, back it off just a little bit. So for me, I'm going to leave that right about at point 0.4, toggling on and off, I see a little bit of sharpening occur. Everything is good to go. Once I get to that position, I can hit OK. And my output sharpening is complete. It is one other layer, one slider. It doesn't get much easier than that to do output sharpening. Now, as you go through and do this more often, you're going to find that you get better and better at figuring out what is your specific just right level. Now, we know that that just right level, that applied to an image that had about 13 by 19 on photo paper. Well, what happens if I'm, if I'm going bigger? What happens if I'm using a matte media, something fine art? Well, typically, as I get bigger, I can leave the sharpening about the same on the image, somewhat counterintuitive. But as I start getting a little bit smaller, that image is going to be more scrutinized by whoever is looking at it. You know, they're going to pull it right up to their face and check out that 4 by 6 or 5 by 7. I tend to take my sharpening up just a little bit. So in my detail, I go up about an extra 0 0.05. Now, if I'm going to a matte media type, maybe something like a velvet or a watercolor, I like to go up a full 0.1 to 0.15 from whatever my just right level is. So in most cases, when I'm going to a matte media, it's going to look a little bit over sharpened. A very, very simple process. But we're not done just yet. Okay, there is one other thing that I would like to talk to you about. At Light, we say there are five things that should never be sharpened. 
Okay? Because these five things have small levels of detail, things that that boost slider would find. Small level of detail that, that's present in things like the sky or in human skin, if I amplify that detail, what do I really get? Well, I end up with kind of a grainy, noisy sky. I could take maybe a, a woman's face, and let's take a look at how that might, might appear in, in detail. So here, here's a young model that we photograph out here at light. I'll create a, a topaz sharpen layer for Brit here, and launch into detail. Now this is an image where you know I'd love to have a little bit of sharpening in fine detail areas. But if I take my small detail slider and I move it all the way up to maybe I'm going to go to that 0.5 starting position, notice what happens to her skin. All those small details start to become visible. So I love what I'm getting here on the teeth, the lips, the eyes, the lashes, but I don't necessarily like what I have going on with the skin. Those are the real small details that we don't typically pick up with the human eye, but programs like Detail are, are so sophisticated, they do pick those up, and we need to be careful that we don't sharpen those as well. So looking back at a, a series of images, what are the things that we at Light say you should never sharpen? I want to go through these five things, and it doesn't matter what program you're using, you should never sharpen these five things. Uh, the first thing is the sky. If I'm sharpening the sky, I'm going to take that fine detail in there, the small tonal and color changes, and it's going to end up grainy or noisy. The second area that we should never sharpen is areas of constant color, things that all appear the same, but there's really small differences in between them. The next thing that we really shouldn't sharpen is water. If we take a look at this image, water tends to show me such incredible detail and, sh and highlights that if I sharpen those, they're going to take over and compete with my main subject. The next thing that we tend not to sharpen is out of focus areas of the image. Places that are out of focus that have that beautiful bouquet, if I sharpen that, it's going to end up looking noisy or grainy. The final thing that we shouldn't sharpen, and this is a big one, especially if you don't want to piss somebody off, is we shouldn't sharpen human skin, especially female skin. So those five things we want to avoid as much as we possibly can with our sharpening. Once again, those were the sky, areas of constant color, the water, especially flowing water, out of focus areas of the image, and human skin, especially female skin. So what I want to do is apply that to, to Brit again here. So I'll put her back into Photoshop. I still have my topaz sharpen layer. And I want to do my Goldilocks output sharpening because I'm going to print this and to have, have Brittany use it in her portfolio. So I'll go in and I want to sharpen, filter, topaz, and detail. And I know I'm going to start my initial spot is right there at about 0.5, just like we did before. Toggle on and off, and I'll see that it's a little too much. When you are working an image that has one of these five things, what I want you to do is ignore the skin or the sky or the water and concentrate just on the fine details of the image because we're going to get rid of those and just the skin in just a moment. So I'll back off that small detail to about 0.4. Once again, this is about the simplest sharpening you can get. Not only is it great in terms of halo and artifact-free operation, but it's one slider. I can't tell you how much I love that. I'm a very simple man at heart and one slider puts a big old smile on my face. So I get to about 0.41 here, and I'm liking the effect on the eyes. Output sharpening is complete. I hit OK. Detail, one slider, and I'm good to go. Now, to make this a little more focused, something you can do is inside of Photoshop, use a mask. If I add a layer mask, then I can easily go in with a brush and paint out the areas, maybe say the skin, if I didn't want to sharpen the hair, any place I paint with black is not going to get that sharpening effect. So I can end up with the sharpening just in places that I want it. I'm doing a very quick, uh, very fast mask here. But what it does is this targets our sharpening. We want to not only have effective 
simple sharpening, but we want it to be targeted only on those places that have fine detail and a little bit of texture. So when we couple our topaz detail sharpen layer with a layer mask, that's when it really comes together for us. Now just one final thing to show you here before we take a few questions. There is a way that you can do this, an automated way to make a mask for you that is very, very detailed. I'm going to talk through it real quick. You can find a video for this on, on YouTube at Light Workshops channel. And I'll also make available to Nicole, uh, we'll see if we can find a way to give this a, as a download so everybody can do this. You couple your topaz detail output sharpening with this layer mask and it doesn't get any better and it really doesn't get any easier than what we're about to show you right here. So I'm going to go through this relatively fast just to show you my output sharpening and where you're probably going to end up as you start to take more and more control over your sharpening. The first thing I'm going to do is find a channel that has really nice contrast, and I'm going to make a copy of it. Once I have this copy, I want to find the contrast. And I'm going to do that with a Find Edges filter inside of Photoshop, and I end up with kind of a, an ugly looking image at this point. But, though, but seeing as it's all black and white, if I invert, it starts looking a little bit like a mask. So I can add a couple different effects to this, and here I'm just adding a, a little levels adjustment. And then I'll go in and, and paint out areas that I don't think are necessary. Okay. And once again, I'm going through this relatively quick, but I'll kind of anchor on the final product and why it's, why it's a great thing for us. So I'll get rid of all these places. I really don't want that much detail. I want to blur this just slightly about a one pixel blur on this image. And then I'm going to take this and load it as a selection. Because once I have that selection, and you can see my, hopefully you can see the marching ants here, they're just around the eyes, the teeth, the lips, places that there is detail, but there's no skin. With this, I add a layer mask, and just to show you, there's what my layer mask looks like. I take my topaz detail sharpen layer with a very detailed mask, and as I toggle my visibility icon on and off, I get a little bit of sharpening only in places that I want it. This is targeted output sharpening as easy as it gets. Using Topaz Detail to make this happen is simple. It's a single slider. It gives you effective, efficient halo and artifact tree sharpening that I can target with mask, and I'm ready to go to the printer. A great process. I'm a big fan of this, and for those that, that know me and have printed with me, uh, you know that I love printing. I'm a big, big fan of sharpening, and one of those things that will ruin a print faster than anything else is making it over-sharpened. So we've got to know that right amount, have the right tool to give it to us, and make sure that it's targeted. So that's, that's a real quick and dirty on an output sharpening workflow using the single slider of Topaz Detail to make it happen. We got uh, any questions out there? Nicole, has anybody been? Uh... Yes, we do have a couple questions. <laughs> um, we've answered quite a bit now. of them. Oh, no, 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 that's great. That was a great presentation. Thank you. One question that a couple people have asked is, do you recommend using any sort of other sharpening method when doing this as well, or do you recommend just using one sharpening method at a time? You know, I recommend just one sharpening method at a time because when I'm considering a in particular output sharpening, there's really only one thing that I need to do, and that is to enhance fine edges and texture detail at a very local level. And I can get that all done here with one slider very, very easily. Now, there are a lot of other methods to do output sharpening. If we look at Photoshop alone, I could do high pass, I could do smart sharpen, I could do unsharp mask, uh, I could probably keep going with a whole bunch of others. But there's really no reason to do those when I'm looking at output sharpening, when I have something this effective and this simple. So I, I typically, for output sharpening, one method. And when I look at something more like creative or content sharpening, then I might use some of those other methods depending upon my, my final effect that I'm looking for. But quite honestly, when you're looking at content or creative sharpening, that's when we start going into the medium detail 
large detail groups of sliders here because those are not necessarily about fine detail. They're more giving me shape and form to images, um, something we could talk about for another few hours. But <laughs> those are places that I'd find myself in the, the content or creative process. Great, and with that, you answered quite a few questions. So th thanks for that explanation. <laughs> actually, a lot of people are, you know, wondering what's what are the pros and cons of, you know, topaz detail versus all of these other, all of these other sharpeners out there. And I think you hit the nail on the head that it's just a really simple process. It's very localized. So yeah, it's um, a simple process, and having that that medium and large ability to control it, with just I don't touch those sliders. It, it gets simple. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see here. We have a couple other questions, and then I'll take the screen back from you. Um, is okay. output sharpening done last, just before printing? A few people are asking that. A absolutely. Output sharpening is something that should be at the end of your workflow, especially when combined with that, that, that thought process of I have a master file and then an output file. And I'm going to have an output file for every different uh, size print, and media type that I use. Now once I've created that output file, then the, the output sharpening occurs near the end of that workflow. The only thing that I do after the output sharpening is I go in and do that soft proofing concept and just and I do it primarily to look and see which rendering intent I'm going to choose. But output sharpening, that belongs at the end. Okay, and to kind of uh, go off of that question as well, are you making a flattened copy of your master uh, file before going into the sharpening step, Helene uh, would like to know. You know, I, I typically do, and for my for my output file, the first step when I when I transition from a master to an output is my first step in Photoshop is file save as, and I'll save it as a specific output file. Once I know that I'm not going to damage the master file, it has all of my layers and all my great stuff in it, then I will I will start from a flattened position when I do all of my sizing and sharpening. A question that, that typically follows that is do I need to then flatten the image before I print? And what we found here through extensive tens testing at light is that no you don't. Um, you don't we haven't seen a difference, a, a noticeable difference in the prints if I'm using a flattened file or I maintain my layers. The print process is, is very iterative. It's not typically a uh, first print is perfect and that can oftentimes be the case with sharpening. So I like to maintain that sharpened layer available. So after the print comes out and I do a nice critical review, if I think I have a little too much sharpening, I can still go back and with that layer right there, I can slide my layer opacity down and decrease the overall effects of the sharpening. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Hal. This has been a learning experience for a lot of us, so thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us, and if you want to stay updated on some upcoming webinars, it's at topazlabs.com slash webinars. So thank you so much again, Hal. Really appreciate you uh, taking your time, to, or taking time out today and, and showing us that. Absolutely. You had a great time. Great. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon.